um, thank you so much. Thank you. I love you too. <laughs> um, you know what I love about Craig and Sarah and the organization that they've put together? And thank you very much for having me. I am honored and privileged to be here. Um, what I love about all of it is that there is this seeking of authenticity. You want the person standing in front of you to be real. And when I first got that invitation um, through my speaker agency, the contract says you've got to speak for 30 minutes. And I have fulfilled, I think, uh, the contract, which is I've got these about, uh, how many pages? Uh, 20 pages to read to you. And everything in here, you can Google. And my question to you is, would you like this? Or would you like this? The second one. OK, so the first one is about what is woke? What is wokeism? Where did it come from? All the theories, I've got all the footnotes. I went as far back as the French postmodernist thinkers and so on and so forth. There is nothing you cannot find on Google. And if you can't, you can still talk to Peter Bogosian who is going to be here later, or who has been here before. On this one, I was just in the waiting room having my little panic attack about speaking to a large group. And I've put three questions down. And I'm going to do what Donald Trump does, which is just a conscious stream or stream of consciousness, so whatever they call it. <laughs> and so on this one, I'm going to try and attempt to answer question number one, which is the question I have for myself, which is, why, Ayan, why do you love the Enlightenment? My second question is, I came to the Netherlands and I truly fell in love with it. And you know when you love, you're blind. There are things you don't see, because you see all the wonderful stuff. And I'll tell you about all the wonderful stuff that I saw. And then finally now, I'm this 52-year-old mature woman, mother of two, wife, um, living in America. I mean, it doesn't get better after this, does it? Um, if you don't like it I'm in America, where will you go? Switzerland? No. Nah. Mars? Maybe. Ask Elon Musk. But we're not there yet. And so at this age, I'm still in love. I love the Enlightenment and the legacy of the Enlightenment. But now I'm beginning to see stuff. And so these are the three things that I'd like to share with you for the coming 30 minutes, and then make it interactive. You ask me what you would like to ask me. And all I promise is honesty. If I don't know the answer to a question, I will say I don't know. If I think I know it, I'll take the risk. If I'm confident, I will share that with you, and I could be wrong. And please don't hesitate to tell me that I'm wrong. OK, so why do I love the Enlightenment? You won't understand it. I can't explain it to you unless I talk to you about my childhood. I grew up in a tribal environment. My grandmother who raised me, she and her family, when she was a little girl, they were going from waterhole to waterhole in what is now called Somalia. 
she had all sorts of stories about what life was like. But what strikes me is that she loved it and she respected it. And later on in life, when her children and grandchildren introduced her to modernity, she liked some stuff, but not all of it. So in keeping with my grandmother's religious and tribal um, rituals and customs, at the age of five, my genitals were cut. There was a rationale to that. The pain was inexplicable. But her rationale was, we've got to do this, even though you're only five, we've got to do this because if we don't do this, the enemy across the other tribe, the other clan, is going to come and get us. And you, if you don't do this stuff, you're going to be someone's slave. Your children will be slaves. Your boys will be killed. And female genital mutilation, I'm talking, listen to me. I'm my grandmother. She's explaining her way of life and her thinking to me. Female genital mutilation is, of course, horrific and it's striking and it's dramatic and all the rest of it. But it wasn't just that. On a day-to-day -day basis, she was enforcing manners, things that you do, things that you don't do because you belong to this clan and not that clan. My grandmother could not read or write. And when I came home from school and I said, well, I had a fight with a little girl and I got my eyes poked out, she said, well, that shouldn't have happened. I'm going to teach you how to fight now. And I was then thrown into this ring where there was this, to you probably, again, inexplicable and horrific. Um, but this girl is scratching me, punching me, rolling me in the sand, and I've got to do just as much back. And I hated it. I hated it. Her explanation remained the same. If you don't toughen up, they're going to come and get us all. So she was enforcing the norms, the rituals, the manners of her particular clan, even though life had moved on. And then my mother's life, who had moved on a little bit from my grandmother's to sort of semi-modern. My mother had left that moving from Waterhall to Waterhall, and they went, she went to Aden. Her older sisters had sort of paved the way. I can see you doing this. Does it mean you can't hear me? Ah, I'm sorry. Um, does it make this? Ah. <laughs> so, my grandmother then says to my mother, oh, let me go back. My grandmother's world is crystal clear. Uh, where her loyalties lie are crystal clear. Where her rationale lies is crystal clear. But when my mother is, she moves from the Somali nomadic desert and goes to Aden uh, and starts to work for a British woman, English, white, um, things start to become ambiguous. There is an attraction, a very strong attraction to modernity. And modernity comes in the shape and the form and the flavor of the white man. And so when, as a little girl, I'm listening to conversations between my mother and my grandmother, and they're talking about the white man. They talk about the white man in three different ways. The white man is dreadful because we had all of this stuff and he spoiled it. 
the white man was also spoken of with admiration. He did things that we couldn't do. He had all of these different clans and factions and so on to get together and to get along and be strong enough that they can come and invade and attack us. So there was something about the white man and his philosophy and his ways and so on that wasn't just mystic, uh, but it was thought of as something to admire. And the white man was also spoken of with disgust. And the disgust part had to do with the way the white man treated his women. So when you saw white women, they were free, unchaperoned, unaccompanied, dressed as they pleased, roaming all over the place, and the female community around me would say they're absolutely out of their minds. If this carries on, they're going to be taken over. Now, fast forward, I grow up, you know, my mother's, my grandmother's nomadic way of life is completely overrun by modernity. Uh, my mother, who was sort of in that ambiguous, she loved the English woman that she worked for because she introduced her to modernity, taught her how to flush a toilet, what a running tap was, all of these things that I think you could put in a Disney movie in these days, but you can't because of walkies. And, and that's this bit. And so, there's this, all, this, all this ambiguity. Um, and so my mother's life is ambiguous. She has one leg in the old clan, tribal, Islamic system, and then she has one leg in whatever modernity brought her. Hannah, I'm looking at you. <laughs> um, and one day she's in love with some of the material comforts that the white man brought. But the other day, she's disgusted by what is happening to her children. When I was a teenager, this is 1984, 85, 86, Nairobi, Kenya, we're dancing to Michael Jackson. We're doing break dance. Uh, we're watching MTV. Um, we are through those uh, images and narratives and um, the culture that is exported from America um, to Africa, we are behaving like teenagers, or we think we're behaving like teenagers in America. And this is disgusting to my mother and the rest of the female community. They hate it. Uh, we had this, I have got to stand up now, maybe you can't hear me, I don't, or maybe I can move it. It doesn't matter, I'll shout. Because, because I want to tell you, we had these like big um, speakers with the round, uh, we were just making so much noise. <laughs> That's what America was exporting. You, you think you saw uh, a music genius. Uh, my mother and my grandmother, they saw noise, disruption, and law culture. Um, all the rest of it. So that was my mother's life. Then I started falling in love with it. And I read Nancy Drews, and I read Enid Blyton's, and I read everything that I'm supposed to read. And I start to imagine myself as an individual, untethered from this culture and tradition that is clan, tribal, and religious. And so by the time I come to the Netherlands, Somalia, or whatever Somalia was imagined to be, is completely falling apart. I'm 22 years old. I have even more reason to believe that the way my mother and my grandmother their tra and their traditions and their religion did things was just simply awful because they couldn't keep their stuff together. We're all fleeing. We're coming back to the white man and saying, help us out. So for me, the secret was, so what the heck is it that this white man has that makes it that he uh, has created societies 
where the largest number of people can live together, not necessarily without conflict, with conflict, but the white man had sort of figured out how to deal with conflict so it didn't become violent. Um, I'm a Somali. I've got the three S's. If you're a Somali and you're a kid, uh, and you're my grandmother's kid or my mother's kid, you have the three S's. Uh, you slap, you stab, and you shoot. And then you say, what was that all about? But by then, everything is destroyed. So then I come in 1992 to the Netherlands. And in the Netherlands, they start talking to me, or I start asking them, so why are you giving me all this charity? Why do I have a roof over my head, et cetera, et cetera? They put up with me. They're wonderful. Uh, and then they have ideas, and they have ideologies, and they have a past, and they have a history, and they, they talk and talk about it. And the enlightenment is introduced to me. Um, this is in Leiden. So I'm having this great experience as a 22-year-old. Also, on the one hand, I'm actually leading the life of a 22-year-old who probably was inspired a little too much by Nancy Drew and Michael Jackson. And on the other hand, there's this curiosity of, but how do they do it? And I sign up to go to Leiden. It's they said they were the oldest university. I suppose every European university says they're the oldest. But I really think Leiden is one of the oldest. Um, and, and there I get, um, what, you know, an introduction. I still want to call it an introduction. But I get steeped in ideas, what ideas mean, what they lead to, and the establishment of institutions. I take political philosophy, political philosophy then introduces, uh, you know, the Greeks, the Romans, the Christians, and then comes the Enlightenment. You know, the Greeks, the Romans, the Catholic Church, I thought was so dull. Because in many ways, even though they were bigger and, and more sophisticated, in many ways they resembled my grandmother's logic. That's what I was getting away from. And so then we come to the enlightenment, and I just fall in love with it. They start to, I get the concept of what an institution is and how it's created and how long it took and the events that led up to the creation of those institutions. And there's this discussion of nation. What is a nation? You know, the Westphalia Treaty, I come from Mogadishu. Where the hell is Westphalia? I don't know. It doesn't matter, but I love the stories. And you know what? They created nation states. And if you visited Europe when I did in 1992, I kind of think they put a line across every tribe and clan and called it a nation. I mean, what is the difference between the Danes and the Swedes if you're an American? or the Dutch and the Belgians. <laughs> you tell me. Obviously, we're, these days we're not allowed to talk that way, but, but I'm gonna talk that way because you're interested in what I have to say about your society and what you inherited and you hold the legacy. And people in this country, in my view, Americans at the moment, in 2022, Americans, the talking Americans, the people who talk on television, in the newspapers who write, I think they're just star craving mad. Because they, all they wanna do is talk about race. And so I'll say, well, then let's talk about race. So now I'm in the white man's world and they've developed all these little borders around every clan and every tribe. And I think, oh God, we could have done that in what we call, what we ended up calling Somalia. Instead of calling it Somalia, we should have called it Machertania. That's the clan that I come from, or my father comes from. And we could have called it Lulbahanti, but that's the one my mother comes from. And we would have these many countries, but we'd be so homogenous and so consistent. And we could have what my grandmother had, which is this little, what she was teaching me, it's not little, it's actually a big deal, um, but it is how you ought to behave to keep your community 
strong enough. You didn't have to be the strongest. You just wanted to be strong enough not to be swept away by a clan or a tribe coming in and seeking power. So I loved what I saw in Holland. I loved the institutions. I loved going to um, the Gemeenderaad. Uh, how do I explain that? The municipality to ask for this or that document. I, I asked for the document. I was asked to pay a little fee and I actually got it. If you're from Africa, it doesn't work like that. You go to the bureaucracy, you, uh, you ask for the document, and the street level bureaucrat behind the screen says you can't have it. And late in the evening, you come back with an envelope with money and you pass that on. And then the next day, if you did that, he gives you the document. Corruption is what you call. Clanism, tribalism is what I call it, whatever. It doesn't matter. But here in America, that's what, oh, in, in Holland, that's what they were doing. And then I went to Leiden, and I went into politics, and I went into all of these things, and I saw conflict, people disagreeing with one another to the extent that in Somalia, we would be embroiled in violence. And in the West, they were not doing it. And it was something called freedom of speech, freedom of expression. And I tried it out. And when I tried it out, my opponents were not the white Dutch. They took freedom of speech and expression for granted. It was my fellow Muslims, fellow immigrants who were saying, and if you say that, we're gonna cut your head off. And you think it's a joke? It's not a joke. Theo van Gogh, Dutch artist, commentator, comedian, living his life, surrounded in the bubble of what is called Holland, thought, wait, well, you are coming into my bubble, and I'm going to say what I've always said. I've provoked the Christians, I've provoked the Jews, I've provoked the atheists, I've provoked women, and I'm gonna provoke you too. This is 2004. And I remember our conversations where I said, they're different. And he said, well, let's test it out. And we tested it out and he lost his head. So I still, in me, I don't know how much of it in me, is that there is the seriousness of You've got to take these things seriously. The man who cut off Theo van Gogh's head did not do it randomly. It wasn't random violence. He did it for a reason, based on his convictions. And even then, I didn't want to question the Enlightenment. I thought we were the anomaly. The Muslims, the immigrants arriving, we had to adapt, and that has been my message, my mission. Let's adapt, let's understand reason, let's understand individualism, let's understand objectivism, what this organization is about. in the hope that it would come from you, those who inherited all of the nice stuff from the Enlightenment, to explain to, of course, babies and children, but also people coming from outside of that culture and say, this is who we are. This is what we stand for. Here are the Here's the stuff that we are going to die for. So unfortunately, in Holland and other parts of Europe, that's not what happened. People sat together, our leaders, and said, maybe we can meet them halfway. Without knowing, without understanding that that concept of meeting each other halfway is parochial. It's yours. 
you have established a society where you can live in peace for two decades, 10 decades, 20 decades. And you got so used to it that you think all we have to do is just explain and reason. And the rest of the world is not with you. In this case, no one is bad or good. It's just that we're different. And the jihadi is telling you, damn you, infidel, if you touch the Quran or the Hadith or my prophet, or I'm going to cut your head off. And it's not a joke. And it's not a joke. And I think Europeans are learning it the hard way. Now, fast forward, and here we are in America where I came and I was told there's something called the First Amendment. And yes, the First Amendment is there. So glorious. And theoretically, you understand it and I understand it. But it's 2022. And there's something called cancel culture. And the First Amendment, it doesn't even feature. Because if I'm afraid of losing my job, if I'm afraid of losing my friends. If I'm afraid, afraid, if I'm a student and I dare not open my mouth about this issue or that issue or that issue, then what the heck is the meaning of the First Amendment? So you can sit here and celebrate objectivity and reason and rationality, but you have to understand that you're living in la-la land. And my question to you, that the woman who came from that tribal society is, what the heck are you going to do about that? Not the Islamists, that's external, not the Chinese Communist Party, that's external. Not Putin, that's external. But the threat to the First Amendment that is emanating from inside, from your universities, your schools, your churches, your institutions, and I look at this day in, day out, and I think for those of us who inherit, well, I came to it, and I chose it, and I fell in love with it, and all the rest of it, you were born into it. Some of you were born into it. And I think we're doing a disservice to the people who fought for all of this. What is woke? I spend days and nights Googling it, I had you 20 pages of what the heck it is. I still don't grasp it, other than an ideology born out of the romantic desire to become primitive. Let's have a conversation about what it is and why. Why this primal scream? I'm quoting the, the term primal scream comes from a book by Mary Eberstad. Uh, it's a primal scream. There's something that is going on in America and in the rest of the West because America leads the rest of the West. If we have a great idea in America, they all have that great idea. If we have a bad idea, a terrible idea in America, they all have it. So you don't understand your position as Americans, as leaders. It's what the heck are we leading to? Why did this thing come and why? What is, what is this monster called woke? That's not a rational question. It's not an objective question. Parts of it are. It's the past that you'll find in Google. But parts of it is not. I hope I haven't used 
all of my time and that I have left some time for questions and I will take it. Thank you. I'm so happy I got to see you. I'm so happy you came here and you got to give this speech. <laughs> um, yeah, my question to you is, um, had you known the level of threats of violence that will happen to you if you spoke for decades to come, would you have still uh, pursued the same path? I think from my, how old are you? 32. 32. So a 32-year-old young woman asks me, I was right around that age, by the way, when I started to speak out, and I could have sort of gone back to my very comfortable life in Holland. Um, you know, when do you decide if you're going to die for something or not? Um, I, don't, I still don't know how to answer that question, but what I thank my grandmother for is that if you believe you belong to this clan, that's the clan you sacrifice yourself and your children for, she'll be disappointed in me that it wasn't the one through the bloodline, and it was through the one chosen in terms of ideas that as a grown-up, as an individual, I decided I want to subscribe to this community of the Enlightenment. That's the one I want to die for. And these people are bringing all that stuff that I ran away from with them, and I'm not going to stand for it. And it didn't begin with, you know, this black and white, uh, if I speak up, I'm going to die. That's not how it started. In fact, years into it, people were saying, you're absolutely nuts. They're going to kill you. Get off. You know, shut up. Um, and I was doing it, and I was saying, but well, they won't kill me. We have the rule of law. I'll call the police. <laughs> uh, but now what worries me for a 32-year-old like you is, who do you call? Hey, thank you so much for having the, uh, I guess, the boldness to say what you said about us potentially being in La La Land if we don't you know, actually speak out. Uh, as we're sitting here, uh, Roe versus Wade, has been overturned, and so I think there might be, yeah, clap it up, I mean, if you agree. Um, I think there might be a lot of violence this weekend. Um, I mean, it's likely to happen, and unfortunately, it's likely to come from a lot of the woke people. Uh, how, do we, how do we navigate this, you know, moving forward? It's gotta be an interesting debate, interesting, you know, fear of people losing their jobs, their homes being vandalized. Just wanna hear your thoughts on this. So again, to reflect on this and think, Raw versus Wade, how many of you just raise your hand if you think it is actually about how do I prevent an unwanted pregnancy? Remember, you are here because you believe in rationality, in reason, in objectivity. And here's the question. It's 2022. You're the most advanced nation on planet Earth. Answer this question. Raise your hand if you think Raw versus Wade is about how do I prevent an unwanted pregnancy? One, two, three. Okay, so the four, five. So that's what you think. You think it is how do I prevent an unwanted pregnancy? It's about the Tenth Amendment. The what? It's about the Tenth Amendment. You know. It's about the Tenth Amendment. Okay, having now confirm that most of you actually understand and see that that really is not the central question, because if that were the central question, then I'll take you back to Holland, I'll take you back to the other European countries that seem to have settled the question, how do you prevent an unwanted pregnancy? Across the Atlantic, they've settled that question, yeah, there are sort of backwater places like Ireland. Mike, I love you, but uh, it, it was quite a bit of time before 
that happen in Poland and places like that. But for most Europeans, after the 1960s and the 1970s, with the advent of the pill, it's not an issue. There, there is no, there's no one there struggling with how do I prevent an unwanted pregnancy? Or once it happens, what to do about it? In Europe, what Bill Clinton said, abortions have to be rare mm -hmm. and safe yes. yeah. and legal is implemented. My experience in Holland, for instance, was the majority of people who were getting abortions were Muslim women who either got pregnant before marriage and would face honor killings or married Muslim women who after baby five and baby six had decided they had had enough and they would sneak out to the abortion clinic and say, take this one out. Mm -hmm. Or it would be members of the Asian communities who had, with the technology that we have, would determine, well, I'm pregnant with a girl. That's not what I wanted. Get her out. So people who went to get abortions, it wasn't the norm. It was, it, it was very different. In America, I just struggle to understand what it is that we're talking about. Are we using abortion as a tool to address teenage pregnancies in black communities? Is that what we're doing? What, why, why in America and America alone do we keep this going and going and going and going? And you know what? The overturning of that, in a way, is welcome. Mm -hmm. Because if you're rational and objective and so on and so forth, you're now going to have to go back and try and answer those very basic questions. Mm -hmm. okay. And the people who think that they have answered those questions and that they want to impose the answers of everyone else, they are the ones who are burning down pro-life facilities. Mm -hmm. Because when we burn down, pro-choice, Planned Parenthood institutions, and all of us are condemned, and it's condemnable mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to use violence. Yeah. But what is going on now is just absolutely disgusting, and it only leads to one violence. thing. And if you know what that looks like, look up Mogadishu, Google it. Thank you. Morning. Thank you very much for sharing your experience with us. You know, uh, it's very inspiring for me because I'm from Guatemala, and you know, Latin America is going through a very difficult situation right now. Uh, like every, everybody is going like to the left, and uh, they want every, everything given by the government. It's been very difficult for us, uh, you know, to make people understand that that's not the way, and um, that everything is being destroyed like, you know, like economy and, and, and culture and all stuff. What would, you, what would be your advice for us, like how to approach people and uh, how can we make people understand? Because, you know, like sometimes, um, I, I'm, I'm talking for, uh, for me, look, I, I feel kind of desperate because you know, even when we make events or we try to, to speak out, they don't get it. I think what, here's the trick, and I think you should make, there's the left, of course, and all these problems are going on within the left who claim that they are the curators of the legacy of the Enlightenment, which at the moment they're not. And so um, you would have to say, here are the things that we are not going to give up on. We're not going to give up on what and this is, I'm again quoting my grandmother and not John Locke. What, what are your traditions and your rituals and your, what is it that you pass on to your children to maintain what you have and what you think you have? And so given, and Locke said it in a different way, but, um, Ultimately, that's what it boils down to, is on the left, you have two sides. There's one side that right now is tongue-tied, 
And then you have one side that are saying, let's break everything down and start with a clean slate, kick them out. Thank you. Hi. So they asked us to, to speak quickly, so I will try to really rush it. So first of all, thank you so much for talking to us. I'm a big fan, and I think a lot of us here are, and it's just an intellectual delight to be able to uh, ask you questions. You. Um, so um, basically, I think most of us here are on the same page with you about the dangers coming from the collectivist left and about the wokeism stuff, right? Um, but there are still dangers coming from the collectivist right, and I have to say I am a little bit disappointed yeah. that the overturning of Roe v. Wade gets a little bit of an applause in this hall. Um, it's... Uh, um, so, it, you know, it's, it's not a perfect law, but it's a fundamental right uh, of, of a woman to choose this most tragic and, and intimate decision. Uh, do you think that now that this has happened this morning, this means that these debates and these Christian fundamentalist ideas, in a way, are coming back, uh, even though we thought they were way back in the past? Is this, what does this mean for our fight for, for rights and for freedom? Well, I'll share with you my observation, which is now, I don't think the American society of 2022 is Christian per definition, um, or that Christian principles determine what we do and what we don't do. Um, I think there are Christians, I think there are Jews, I think there are atheists, I think there are lots of agnostics, lots of confused people, it doesn't matter. But if we adhere to the principles that we should be able to debate these things without violence, then whatever happened this morning will lead to the next step which I am told is distinctly American, which is we're gonna debate it. We're not gonna shoot one another. We're not gonna Molotov cocktail one another. We're not gonna kill one another. So if you believe in that, that we can actually resolve this, and maybe we won't resolve it, but at least we can attempt to have those conversations. As a woman with two children, I want to say, yeah, Let's, let's restart. We did something wrong in the past. It wasn't resolved, otherwise it wouldn't stay this long. Uh, maybe it's a wedge issue for politicians. I, I don't know, I have no clue. But I wanna have the conversation without the violence. The question for America is, can we do it without the violence? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hello. Um, in Ladies of Liberty Alliance in Latin America, we work a lot uh, with the chapters of Africa and Asia because we think no one will have a full liberty until we all in this world achieve it. Uh, how can we in this part of the world change what is happening in that part of the world? It's through international organizations, it's through international law, it's through social organizations. What do you think about it? Ten years ago, I would say, and America needs to do this and dictate that and say this to the rest of the world. Um, but now it's like, well, in America, let's get our stuff figured out first before we start dictating anything out because we come across as ridiculous. I mean, you have to think. I am trying to convince Muslims in the Middle East in Iran, in Afghanistan, you know what, I think it's a great idea if we adopted the principles of the enlightenment and they're saying, look at them, ha, ha, ha. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I would say, let, let's fix our own house first at the moment. Okay. I, like that jo uh, Roe versus Wade, uh, guns, uh, all of this stuff. I think the world is watching very closely how we deal with that. The world is watching very closely what we stand for okay. and who we stand with. And we need to get that right first before we can impose anything outside of our borders. We don't even know where our borders lie. We can't agree on that. We can't agree on who we let in and we keep out. We come, America comes across as ridiculous. So my question is, in general, do the Somalian people and other people in African countries see the Western civilization guilty for its, its slow development to, due to imperialism? Or are they open to see why we materially develop so much in contrast to them? Um, Somalis, people from Mali and Senegal, people from Kazakhstan and Kurdistan, you name it, people from outside of the world still want to come to America. That's the blessing. 
we're still the most attractive nation to come, build a business, build a family, and move around as freely as we possibly can, pursue our curiosities and inquiries and interests, we still are, in that sense, a superpower. But I repeat over and over again, we do need, however, to fix some of the internal problems that we have so that we can remain just as attractive, but not only that, so we can export these beautiful ideas. And I think part of it is we have to take into account not just how rational we are, but also some of the irrationalities that human beings have. And maybe at the core of that is the relationship between men and women. I'm just throwing that out. Thank you. Thanks a lot for sharing the experience. Uh, I come from India, and in India what we're seeing today is that left liberals and people who claim to stand for even liberal democracy uh, are aligning with the worst elements among Islamic fundamentalists to oppose common sense reforms and uh, to um, call for arrest for blasphemy, et cetera. Um, that, so, what this is doing is that it's ceding ground to the right wing, of course. Mm -hmm. And in right wing, there are definitely people, at least some of them, if not many of them, uh, who are not just ag against Islam as a religion or an ideology, but also Muslims as people, right? So what do you mm -hmm. think should our response be? I think most Americans, um, I don't have, I didn't do a survey, um, but I think I'm confident if I say most Americans are not anti-Muslim. I think most Americans will oppose um, some of the tenets of Islam, uh, for instance, the treatment of women. I have been probably the most, um, would you say, determined and, um, relentless critic of the way Islam treats women, would you say that? Yes. But I cannot go to those Muslim leaders and say, because I have to tell you, what am I fighting for? What is it that I think that Islam die, it denies women? I think it denies women a sense of fairness. I'm not campaigning, listen very carefully, I'm not campaigning for vengeance against men. I'm campaigning for fairness. That we, as women, are treated equally and fairly just the way you would treat a male human being. I'm not prepared to go as far as some of the feminists in the West go and pro promote the idea of vengeance against men. I think that's wrong. If you want fairness, you fight for fairness. My feminism is a fight for fairness. And I'm finding more and more men from the Middle East who understand this. What they don't understand is the vengeance. They don't understand being called toxic. Masculine toxicity and so on, they don't understand that. I can't explain it. I can't explain, I, I actually, actually don't like it. I want fairness, not vengeance. And if that's the message that America is promoting to the rest of the world, and American feminists are promoting to the rest of the world, then is fairness is an attractive message. Vengeance is not. Uh, regarding the enlightenment, uh, there's one thing that I've always, you know, disliked about at, la at least the French enlightenment, and this is the technocratic interpretation, where people say, you know, reason is great, so the most reasonable should rule, and of course, our small group of academic experts, well, they are the most reasonable people, you know. Um, do you also see this as an, as an issue with enlightenment, and if so, what would you do about it? Well, I, 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 again, I'm here 
I stand before you to say I'm still in love with the enlightenment, the story of the enlightenment, the principles of the enlightenment, the outcomes of the enlightenment. But now being old and mature, I'm seeing a few cracks here and there that we haven't addressed. I'm a classical liberal, but classical liberalism has its weaknesses. And if in an environment like this, we can't address it, where are we going to address it? And if as a classical liberal, you behave just like the next fundamentalist, then what the hell is the difference? In the interest of brevity, um, do you see anything positive emanating from the woke movement or the progressives? Um, well, like all movements of grievance, they do draw our attention to things that are wrong in society. I think we do have racial disparities. There's no need to close your eyes about that. But you do have to ask the question, why is that? And what can we do about it? But we do have racial disparities. Um, we do have a shrinking middle class. We have to understand why is that happening? So as a movement, I think they, I, I don't speak for you. I speak for myself. I am awoken from my very comfortable um, then, and, and I look around me and I think the people, this small circle of people around me, that's not America. And that I have to get up and start looking for the average American. And we have problems, and they're big problems. But the, the answers that the woke are giving us are all wrong. And they're tyrannical, and they're saying only our way or no other way. They can't figure out whether they're Marxist or neo-Marxist. Uh, they're romantic. They're this, they're that. Uh, some people are leading in the way of the ideology by wanting to destroy institutions. Others are just following. And then there's, of course, the cynicism that drives me absolutely mad. The CEOs of corporations inventing things like ESG, what was that? Environmental and social bullshit. <laughs> what about the shareholders? That you are responsible to your shareholders. And so that kind of thing is happening. Uh, and woke have, uh, and they, they woke us up to this. Uh, but uh, obviously, I'm not going their way. So yes, there's, there's some things that they've done well. And then you say, thank you, and now, please. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Hi. Um, I'm, I, I grew up in America. And sometimes I feel like it's difficult to have an objective perspective on the wokeism mm -hmm. that is all around me, because I've sort of grown up in it. Um, coming from your position, I was wondering if you could draw some analogies between the wokeism that you see that's happening here, mm -hmm. and uh, perhaps some of the traditional religious morality mm -hmm. that from your childhood. Um, if you could draw like three analogies or or what or some comparisons and um, just between the two phenomena. Well, I don't even think I have to go as far as three analogies. I'll just go with one analogy, which is the religion of Islam is traditional. It's been around for what 1,400 years. Christianity has been around for 2,000 years. And there's a reason why these traditions were around. And that means, um, you know, it's people want to hold on to, cling on to something inherent in these traditions. Wokeism is synthetic. Uh, and it's plastic. It's, it's cosmetic. Um, it, it, it's, uh, you know, you can dip in and dip out and be whatever you want. And uh, in that sense, initially, it's attractive. Uh, and it can very quickly lead cultism. Um, and then you have the cult leaders, and you know, I think this country is very much familiar with that. Uh, and so, I, I, I don't know. I haven't uh, quite, just because of the number of institutions they've captured, I think I've got to think this through, so there are parts of what I'm saying that they're not fully answered. Um, but when it comes to what do you offer the average man or the average woman, 
uh, aside from this synthetics of instant gratification, I don't see much else, and you know, everything with instant gratification. It's instant. Thank you. Short-lived. Hello. Hi. Um, <laughs> the, the question I have is what, are, what is the difference between an actually evil zealot and a zealot that is, um, her, that is hurting or is, has been driven to zealotry of, what, of whatever form by other reasons? Also, how should we fight to improve the real issues in America that wokeism pretends to tackle and actually makes worse slash doesn't? One word, power. If you're mentally ill and you're confused and you seek help, you get help, and you know that you're mentally ill, if you don't seek help, the degeneration of the mind starts to happen. The other group, are using, in my view, um, deranged, what we would call deranged, uh, to seek power and get power. And, and it is, they're not seeking just any kind of power. It is power unchecked. You just have to submit and they want to make others submit. So uh, this, this is a very radical statement that I'm going to make, which is I don't often see a huge difference from the committed serial killer and the committed wokeist or is Islamic extremist. It's that kind of wanton power that they're seeking and it's for the rest of us to check it. Two minutes is what I'm told I have. So we've got two, and I have three people. There are th two, three more people behind you. Hi, um, so my question is that um, woke young people from the white first world backgrounds often place their values above human rights. So like Islam must be respected and some women can be stoned. The communist revolution must happen so some people can be starved. Whereas people like you and me from backgrounds with humanitarian issues place human rights above everything. So how do we make these young people understand the importance of human rights and what being threatened with death really means? I think we create programs where they can go to these places. I would love to have programs for Americans to actually go and live for periods of three weeks, three months, six weeks, six months, in all of those places. Uh, and you will never be duped. You come back saying, I want to go home. <laughs> Next. Hi, I, uh, first of all, thank you for speaking. And yeah, uh, I think I know the answer to this question from kind of what I've heard you say to the last few, but um, do you think that the West um, or the US specifically is systemically racist? I don't think that the West is systemically racist. I think that the West and in particular America has created um, uh, a culture and an environment and a society and maybe heads a civilization where if you want freedom, you can be free as much as you want. But there are two things, three things actually. There's the concept of freedom. We have to keep explaining. It's different from the second concept, which is license. And then the third concept, which is service. Uh, and that service bit, I think we preach a lot about it, um, but maybe some of us don't practice it as much. What is it that my neighbor wants that I think I can give him? Is Who's suffering, et cetera, et cetera? We preach a lot about that. And we have, and again, I know the audience that I have in front of me, but you used to have churches religious people telling you, reminding you of service and charity. So if you bring that stuff down and you don't replace it with anything else, then as the West, you expose yourself to these synthetic religions. On those who uh, are romantically longing for a tribal society, <laughs> uh, as someone who did grow up in a tribal society, what would you say to them to paint a picture of what they are asking for? 
Life is short and nasty and brutal. That answered part of my question, but I was curious if you could say what other works of the Enlightenment you found compelling. Please, please repeat that. What other works from the Enlightenment did you find compelling? What works or everything? I mean, look, uh, what that I find compelling? The, the, the books like, like John Stuart Mill, On Liberty. Yeah. Uh, well, let me say, what, let me ask, it, it's like, what is challenging right now? What I find, uh, I need to answer the question, that's the question that keeps me busy right now, is what are we going to do about the relationship between men and women in America that at this moment is hostile. I know that for the majority of women it's not, for the majority of men it's not, but for those on television, social media, et cetera, et cetera, sort of thought leaders, we haven't quite figured out what the heck is going on. And, and I think we should explore that, and I think we should listen to a bunch of people way in the back who are saying, enlightenment is great, but wait a second, what about this, what about this, what about this? And we silenced those voices. So I don't have one book, I have a series of books, articles, thoughts that I'm looking through and I don't know, I, I haven't quite found the most significant. My friend, Christina Hoff Summers, one of my best friends, when I first met her, and this is 10 years ago, um, maybe even longer than 10 years ago, she had written a book called The War on Boys. And I remember seeing the title and giggling and thinking, <laughs> the war on boys, yeah, crack me up. Now, I look back, I actually called her and said, oh my God, you are onto something. That's a book I'd like all of us to reread. Thanks for your courage. <laughs>